questions that you're having from the audience when, um, makes me want to ask you, where do you think the left is going now with this new kind of war? Usually, our enemies are people that are really good guys, and in this case, we have Islam fundamentalists, and I have noticed that the left is absent on so many things. For example, when Iraq beheaded all these women and a lot of human rights groups were pretty upset about it, the left didn't say anything because it wasn't clear. So these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. And I'm wondering, I think they keep you up at night too, where do you think the left is hitting and where would you like them to hit? And is there a left that you think is a responsible response to what's happening in the changing world? Well, you know, I mean, I'm really tempted to take that as a statement, and a very good one, too. I mean, not just of your own observation that the left has failed a lot of these tests, but of the, of the realization that something ought to be done about it. But I, I hope I've given you an idea of what I would think about that right now. Have I not? I mean, if, if people really think I haven't, I'll have an, another try. But if you, if you take the case of, um, of, say, September the 11th, you have an organization that is partly a, bank, a, a, a really corrupt multinational, I'm talking about Al-Qaeda now, partly a really corrupt multinational corporation run by Saudi capital and supported by the Saudi oligarchy and, secret, and the Pakistani secret police. It's partly that. It's partly a, a crime family. It's partly a cult organization, and it's partly a fascist cult uh, group. This is, I think, an enemy, right? Uh, a pretty reactionary enemy, a pretty obvious. It's not just that its methods are the mass destruction of civilians, using civilian aviation to inflict further death of civilians, but its objective is a Stone Age society without music, culture, philosophy, dialectic of any kind at all. The model of being Taliban Afghanistan. It's not my objection to their means, it's to their objectives. This uh, attack puts the working class of New York in the, in the driving seat, in the saddle. It makes a direct attack on, on democracy and on secularism and on pluralism and by the indiscriminate nature of its tactics on everything that we hold dear by way of the multicultural Ethic, hundreds of Muslims are killed in those attacks, people from every nationality as well. You couldn't really have a more clear confrontation between, let's, let's at least say, left liberalism and the right. And the left says, well, I don't know, what about East Timor? This is disgraceful. To, to try and evade, to try and sit out a moment like that really invites historical condemnation of the kind that you can't, you can't appeal to later. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, maybe I think differently. You're tested by how you react at a moment like that, just as you are indeed when you read the reports of planned and organized genocide in northern Iraq, which we have. We have all the evidence to charge the under the Genocide Convention. And the Genocide Convention, by the way, mandates immediate action by any state as soon as the information is received, either to prevent or to punish. Now, people who are looking for neutral or evasive positions here, I think, do, do not deserve the name radical. So what you're really asking me is this, is to say what I've come to believe, which is that a very large number of the American left have become a status quo force. And what they really wish about all this is that it hadn't come up, and it hadn't happened, and we didn't have to think about it, because then they could go on with their domestic agenda, whatever that turns out to be. Perhaps prescription drugs for seniors. As you say, sir. As you so rightly say. I find your allegiance, please. I find your allegiance to the Kurds admirable, and a number of other points of your. Michael, could you stand back a little? I think it's. Okay. Uh, your allegiance to the Kurds is admirable, and a number of the other points you're making are very sound from, as it were, a local or a regional perspective. But, you, but by talking about the evils elsewhere um, enables you to simplify the situation and kind of slide off in addressing the question directly, which I'd like you to deal with directly. There's deep concern here about the triumphalism and uh, ascendancy of the United States.
United States, not in abstract terms, but in a real historical situation in which uh, its driving forces and character are in the hands, uh, how can I say it delicately, worse than they have ever been in my life. Okay. I never thought I'd wish to have Richard Nixon back as just a simple egomaniacal thug. He looks like Mother Teresa, looks like by comparison. Okay, would you please address this question directly? What about the problems with American ascendancy in this situation? Well, um, after what you said about uh, Dick, um, I think you'll have to admit that even if you accuse me of, of, be, of being simple, you, you are confused. Um, I can't say everything each time. Um, your question wasn't very direct. But if you want me to say what the misgivings are, uh, it's pretty easy to do. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, judge Garzon in Spain, who was the, the heroic judge in the Pinochet case, and in many other human rights cases, uh, not long after September 11th, uh, apprehended the first Al-Qaeda cell that was fully busted um, in Europe. It was in Madrid. He had them all collared and locked down before the FBI and the CIA had even really worked out that there'd been an attack of any kind at all. And incidentally, when is anyone going to be fired at the FBI and the CIA for being asleep at the switch on this? And for eating such a gigantic share of the national security budget and leaving us defenseless under open skies? Don't ask. Anyway, Judge Garzon had got them. He'd got a, a, a team, six of them. But he said, I, and I'm willing to hand them over. He said, but I can't hand them over to any country that has capital punishment because European law forbids that. You can't extradite people to a nation that is, that is uh, going to execute them. Uh, this is the only country comparable to itself that retains the barbaric practice of capital punishment. Now, John Ashcroft, as he's recently shown in the, in the Malvo case and others, prefers the exercise of capital punishment to the doing of justice, of course, but he also prefers it to law and order. The fetishizing of this filthy human sacrifice penalty means more to him than, say, cooperation with someone like Judge Garzon in the fight against terrorism. That's what tells you what you're up against. People who are ideological fanatics and not competent to defend us from enemies, either foreign or domestic. Furthermore, in their grandiosity, they insist on saying, well, all this is designed to make sure that American superiority goes on militarily now and forever, and can never be challenged by any other power. Which means to say, you're saying also to people in Spain and Britain and Germany, by the way, if you want to join us and help fight what is after all a common threat, we want you to know your soldiers are dying for American supremacy and superiority. It's not a very brilliant way of proceeding or of, um, or of achieving uh, solidarity. And I could go on, and uh, I hope you wouldn't doubt me uh, that I've generated in print and on screen a number of other criticisms of this kind, but don't mistake me. Um, I'm, I'm uh, bringing these up because I'm committed to a, a, a pitiless and conclusive victory in this war. And I'm not, I'm not bringing up these criticisms for any other reason, and I don't trust anyone who I suspect of doing so. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, Professor Adams kind of asked you about two main areas, which is uh, Henry, Henry Kissinger book and then uh, the war on Iraq. But there was an area of, in can which you produce, like, can you there was an area in which you wrote extensively, and that is uh, the question of Palestine. So my question is, uh, could you please expand and comment on the situation in Palestine right now and on the Palestinian movement for uh, justice and liberation? Thank you. Well, the, um, I think I may have to ventriloquize the questioner who he asked me to, for my comments on the present state of affairs in, in Palestine. Uh, it's, he doesn't ask anything very specific. I, 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 I don't feel just like running off at the mouth about what I think about what's going well, on. Well, you should. It's a subject worth running. Yeah, but I'd like, to be asked a proper, I'd like to be asked a question, if you know what I mean. It's like saying, talk about yourself. You know, you suddenly think, All right, uh, well, I know the subject, but I wonder what the hell... I have, I have a question more specific. The question would be... Is, is the two-state solution still viable in your... Ah, that's much better. Thoughts? That's a lot better. Thank you. Well, it's, no, it's, that's much better because it dramatizes something very important. It's quite clear that the present government in Israel hopes to uh, avoid it uh, or forestall 
a two-state solution by completing the annexation of the occupied territories as quickly as it can and pronouncing that a fait accompli by making it undoable. Some people, Meron Benvenisti for one, Eil Weizmann for another, have produced impressive documentation suggesting that the annexation of the territories is already nearly complete. And this, of course, very much reduces the pressure uh, on Palestinians uh, to uh, consider a two-state solution as their program either. And uh, the, uh, one of the appalling consequences or causes of that, because I believe it to be both cause and consequence, is the decision by some Palestinian organizations to conduct attacks within Israel itself upon kibbutzim or old people's homes or civilian targets within the borders of pre-1967 Israel um, and suicide attacks, um, murder attacks in Jerusalem and elsewhere, which quite clearly express the intention uh, to remove all Jews from Palestine. Now, that, that is, of course, precisely the propaganda with which Ariel Sharon uh, would like to deal uh, because it justifies his own rejectionism. And in my opinion, the Palestinian parliament, for example, would already have voted Mr. Arafat out, as it nearly did, if Mr. Uh, Sharon hadn't confined Mr. Arafat in Ramallah. So there's an, another negative dialectic here, if you like, another negative ecumenicism, where the thuggish elements on both sides feed upon one another. Well, here, clearly, a very, a very special responsibility descends upon the United States, which has the power uh, to arrest um, these settlements and the power to uh, enforce a solution, and uh, instead pretends to be both uh, uh, a mediator um, while, in fact, it's a participant. And that seems to me something that American voters and uh, citizens should all long ago have forced them to decide about. Is the United States a mediator in the Palestine dispute, or is it the patron and armorer and financier of one side in it? We can't go on like this much longer. Yes, my name is Joseph Anderson, and I say that to say that uh, if anyone's interested, they can plug my name into a search box in the Berkeley Daily Planet or the San Francisco Chronicle and read a letter that I wrote about the former SFM on 12-16-00. Uh, um, uh, December 16, 2000, and in the San Francisco Chronicle on <laughs> December 18, 2000. Um, I would like to say that uh, I've had an amiable acquaintanceship with uh, Christopher Hitchens. I've agreed with him on some issues, disagreed with him on other issues, and uh, I dare say corrected him on still others. I must say that I'm shocked that, in a, that a Mario Savio Award recipient was not allowed her free speech to make a comment tonight, but restricted only to a question. I would welcome a real debate such as this in almost any other venue. But I believe that a debate, a pseudo-debate, hardly even a debate like this, where we have a, we have a, a lecturer who's pro-war in Yugoslavia, pro-war in excuse Afghanistan, me. and pro-war in Iraq, is an insult to the memory of Mario Savio. And I hate to say this, but I believe that Lynn Hollander Sabio has become the Coretta Scott King to the memory of Mario Sabio. Okay, excuse me. This is an insult. Why don't you guys, why don't you guys clap that too? Why don't you clap that too? This should not be clap. allowed Go on, clap. to happen. Monkey. Excuse me, could we have the next question, please? The, the Guardian News... Contemptible Sorry. remark. Shameful, contemptible remark by a guy who always comes to my readings, always takes up everybody's time, always awards himself airtime, and never buys one of my damn books. <laughs> Probably because he can't read. You talk more than almost anyone I know. No, leave him there. Leave him, leave him there. It's fine. Could you? The, the leave him there. Could you go on with the next yeah. question, please? The Guardian newspaper. You knew what you looked like, mister. Uh, uh, his comments on um, when you compare what they uh, said about September 11th, you compare it to what they wrote about uh, the sarin gas attack in Tokyo or 
the bombing of the Oklahoma Federal Building. In your opinion, what about September 11th was so attractive to the Guardian newspaper? I didn't get the last sentence, I'm sorry. Like, in your opinion, what about the September 11th attack was so attractive to the editorial staff of the Guardian newspaper? Manchester Guardian, so it's your, it's your countryman. What about the September 11th attack was so attractive to the editorial staff of the Manchester Guardian? That's an extraordinary question. I mean, I, um, I don't really think it's a proper question for me. I have no insight into their editorial processes. If you mean why did September the 11th get more coverage than, say, the sarin gas in the Tokyo subway, which I believe you mentioned. Why did they not condemn the September 11th why did, they, why did the Guardian not condemn the September 11th attacks, you ask? Well, I'm sorry, I, uh, we, are, we have a planetary difference here. <laughs> you. you managed to do this whole presentation quite... A, I agree with you 100% on the crimes of religion. Uh, we have no disagreement on that. But you did not once in your presentation mention the fact that the United States, who, who, which, is, which you are defending, is responsible through its military and economic arms for the deaths of tens of millions of people in the world every year. Compared to what the Muslim fundamentalists, by the way, who were largely created as a political force by the United States, and they're still in many places used by the United States as a, as a, as a political force against the left where necessary, Compared to them, though, well, uh, uh, I mean, compared to the United States oppression and murder around the world, these fundamentalists are, are small-time players. And if anybody but these fundamentalists uh, killed 3,000 Americans in retaliation for what the U.S. did, I think a reasonable person could say it was a drop in the bucket for what the U.S. really has coming as a nation. Thank you. Well, thank you, too. Did you want to comment? No. Of course not. Let me Hi. My name's Abe Gardner. I'm with the Berkeley ACLU. I'm an executive with Common Cause of California at Berkeley, and I'm with Democracy Matters on campus. I'd like to ask you a question regarding oil. Um, I feel as though the response that um, you gave to the question earlier was indeed interesting and has an interesting point, but I'd like to know more about if, this, if Saddam Hussein were to gain weapons of mass destruction, and if he did, had the ability to control up to 44% of the oil reserves of the world in that region as a result due to change or shift in the balance of power, I don't understand how you can justify a claim that this is not a war about oil, particularly given the political interests of the Bush family. But my dear sir, did I not plainly say that anyone who didn't think war, oil was worth fighting about was a fool? But if, clearly it's a, a, a war about oil. You said before... That oil is worth fighting over, must be fought over, if it's not to become the property of megalomaniac, uh, pyromaniac uh, despots. Yes, I certainly, most certainly did. I, I mean in terms of the power of the United States in the oil industry, rather than in terms the of money going to a specific person who you clearly disagree with. Thank you. I mean, people used to say there were braver slogans in the old days, like, no blood for Texaco, for example. Or, and I remember it myself, um, the, the obvious fact that the United States government had overthrown uh, an elected regime in, in Iran, the Mossadegh regime in the 1950s, in order to uh, get a preponderance of American oil companies over British ones in the Anglo-Iranian Oil Corporation. This was all great stuff. We could do real populism then about empire, oil, and attacks on democracy. The sad thing is that none of it applies now, as you can see from the whimperingly no good slogans that you get, like, no war over oil, which means nothing unless you think oil is unimportant. Now, it bears on an important question that hasn't come up, which I might just take a minute on. Many people say, look, Saddam Hussein may be horrible. Everyone likes to clear their throat this way and say they don't really like him. Um, everyone except Ramsey Clark and a, a few fans of the Ba'ath Party want to get this out of the way. Of course, we agree he's a bad guy. But, you know, he understands self-preservation, he understands deterrence, he can be boxed in, and so forth. Now, having invaded Kuwait, which was an insane thing for him to have done, and having refused pressure from almost every member of the Arab League, the whole of the United Nations, and every other conceivable neighbor or international group to withdraw his forces, 
Uh, Saddam Hussein was told by an, a note delivered personally by James Baker that he was going to be pushed out by a coalition that involved the Egyptian army, the Syrian army, the French army, everyone you can think of. Uh, but that, uh, and the, there was no chance that he could resist being pushed out, but he was to not do two things. He was not to try and use no, nerve or chemical gas agents on American or coalition forces on pain of what were called the most extreme and severe consequences. And he was not to set fire to the Kuwaiti oil fields before he abandoned them. Now, we don't know, at least I will claim I don't know, whether the Gulf War syndrome and some other illnesses do result from some rash commander, perhaps with orders, trying out nerve gas in that war or not. The jury's out on that. There's a strong suspicion that he did, but there's no doubt at all that on his way out of Kuwait, he blew up the Kuwaiti oil fields, set them up, set them ablaze, flooded the Gulf, killed, new, normal for those of you who care about these kinds of things, and I know you do, killed huge numbers of seals, birds, that kind of thing. <laughs> While I'm in Berkeley, I'm not going to waste this opportunity. Um, generally behaved very bad, but, but also insanely, megamaniacally, pyromaniacally, um, and without, without rationality. Now the question is, do you want to find out what this guy would be like if he ever got the uranium or the plutonium? Do you want to find that out or not? Or would you rather say that we've seen enough and we would rather take the side of his enemies and of his people and see the last of him? I think that's a no-brainer myself. There's another guy, another guy advertising his wares from the back of the hall. A cheap peddler crying his uh, wares from there. Um, in, we d we're not going to... No takers, I understand. So we're, we're not going to get everybody to a, you know, come to a consensus, so that's fine. Let's go. <laughs> uh, in 1989, Benjamin Netanyahu told a group of... Uh, I'm too tall, the microphone's too short. Um, in, in 19, it's fine. In 1989, Benjamin Netanyahu told a group of Israeli college students that Israel should have took advantage of Tiananmen Square massacres to expel Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza. In recent polls this summer, over 60% of Israelis supported transferring Palestinians from the occupied territories. With the rightward shift of Israel, with the elections coming up, with the fact that it, uh, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is a leading Likud candidate, um, what do you think about the prospects of Israel using the war in Iraq as a cover for ethnic cleansing as a lot of Palestinians and Israelis right now are, are afraid of? And has that figured into your you know, calculations and your position on uh, the war in Iraq? Thank you. Um, the, the Sharon government has invited, the situation is in some ways worse than you say, in some ways perhaps not as bad. The Sharon government has invited on more than one occasion its shifting coalitions. Uh, the supporters or leaders of uh, pro-expulsion parties into, into the Israeli cabinet. It's uh, well known. Uh, people who openly advocate what is disgustingly called transfer. In other words, the, the, de the deport forcible deportation of the remaining Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza, in, either into Jordan across the river or into Gaza, into a kind of massive holding pen uh, pending a, a further solution. Um, and there are uh, it's very s sad to have to say, uh, quite a number of uh, people in the United States, including quite senior Republican congressmen and spokesmen for the Christian Coalition and others who have also advocated this. Um, and it seems to me a great, a great responsibility on everybody's part to repudiate this idea of a, of a racist cleansing campaign. Uh, whether it was conducted under cover of war or for any other reason. Now the question is, would war make it more likely or less? I personally think it makes it less, but I hope I'm, I hope I'm not being optimistic because the, um, the United States government in, the, in such a case, it seems to me, would have no choice at all but to forcibly restrain Israel or any, or any crazy general or politician who liked the idea from taking advantage of uh, a war which involves the international interest, the will of the UN, and a whole number of other very important civilizational questions. For Israel to take advantage of such a thing to pursue a policy that is evidently racist and repulsive would be unpardonable and I think would be opposed. I think would be opposed. But it's something I think there should be a lot more vigilance about than there is and I think it's very badly reported in our press that there is this constant threat for, um, for, a, for a cleansing of the, of the occupied territories. I, I think we 
baby should take one more question from each, each side, and then uh, Christopher will be out at the table uh, signing books, and you can talk to him individually at that time. If you're holding a receipt. Yeah. <laughs> the pro bono period will be over by then. Okay, let's go over here. Uh, you said that, you know, no blood for oil is simplistic, and, uh, you know, and of course oil is worth fighting for. I, I just wonder how far do you go with that? I mean, is it worth burying people alive in the desert for oil? I mean, if you ask me, you ask me, I mean, you seriously ask me specifically, is it worth not just fighting for oil, a war, but fighting a war in which people were killed? Were buried alive. Think, shall we say, or burned alive. Why not burned alive? Why not blown to pieces? Why not? Um, How many I, I Iraqis think, are going mean, to die I don't think, it, I don't think it's a very, change. I don't think it's a very deconstructive uh, um, rephrasing of my original point. I mean, yes, if it's worth fighting for, I'm willing to accept that what I'm willing to accept what's entailed in what I say. Can you take one more question, sir? Just one more question. Am I going Just to enlist? More. That's a good one. Can you take one more question, sir? Just one um, more I, question. I hope, it, I hope it has struck people by now that we're talking about a war or series of conflicts in which, um, in which civilians, are, uh, American civilians, are Just, uh, quite near the front line. In fact, nearer than many soldiers are. So it seems to me ridiculous to, um, uh, to ask of people whether they favor the war or oppose it, what their attitude to enlistment is. You've already been enlisted, sweetie, uh, by being a civilian. Sir, can uh, I ask you one I, more question? Could I have a question here, actually? I'll, I'll give you a chance to. But sure. I've, well, hello. Well, yeah, okay. Can I've you, noticed, I've ever, I've, Christopher, I've read a lot of what you've written in the past year, and you never talk about the uh, people who may be killed in this war. Uh, not the Iraqis or the Americans. And I think you are con when you talk about the Americans who are on the front lines, you are conflating the Iraqi war and uh, the bin Laden forces, uh, which are not one and the same, in fact. And I would just like you to address the question of uh, the numbers of people that may be killed in this war and is the consequence at what point do, is that consequence outweighed by, um, you know, the oil? Is it, how many people are worth uh, killing in order to protect the oil? Well, <clears throat> it's very flattering of, me, of you to ask me as if I knew the answer to what, to whether more people. It's very flattering. <clears throat> excuse me. It's distinctly flattering to be asked. So respectfully and politely, I must say, as if I might know whether more people would die, whether Saddam Hussein forced us into war now or later. I mean, in other words, that I could guarantee, I could tell you in advance what the respective tolls might be, um, or how many people he might kill if there was no war with him at all. I can't tell you the answer to that either. I would suspect on the past uh, evidence a lot would be the answer. On your point of conflation, um, I'm not so sure you're right to say that the, the civilian soldier dichotomy um, is as strong as you think. I don't know who put anthrax in my mailroom in Washington uh, last year. Uh, nobody does yet. I know there are people who think it would be witty to make it smallpox uh, instead. And I know that the Iraq has been involved in uh, producing and distributing a great deal of this stuff. And I certainly know those are the weapons of choice of the other side. So no, I don't feel that there's any uh, question at all. One reason why people are taking this argument so seriously is because in the age of weapons of mass destruction, wielded by the way by either side, the distinction between civilian and soldier is more or less morally abolished, at least as, re as regards safety or the right to criticize. After all, if I was a woman taking this position, um, and suppose I was 55 and a mother, you wouldn't taunt me for not putting on a uniform and say I had no right to my opinion, would you? So if you don't want to be addressed as a moron, don't talk to people as if they were stupid. Well, sometimes the temptation is a bit much, I have to say. 
Yeah, um, well, after 150 years of history of intervention around the world, uh, again, what have we got like here? Allende, in Panama, in Yugoslavia, overthrowing government, what do you think guarantees that the United States is going to be fair and impose justice wherever it goes with this? Uh, uh, with these armies, and uh, why do you think the United States has the right to intervene all around the world and impose its bases all around the planet and its corporations around the planet and this, this uh, very honorable uh, intent of uh, bringing democracy around the world? Uh, I, I mean, where do you find those morals uh, in, in this regime? And then uh, the other thing is, uh, if you are so concerned about the life of the Kurds, uh, are you concerned about the people who were killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all of the other war that the United States carry around the planet? Uh, I, I mean, are you concerned about that? Are you concerned about the weapon of mass destruction that the arsenal that the United States has? Uh, I, I, I could you, mean, could uh, you finish up, please? Uh, these are questions. These are all questions. Uh, so, uh, the, the last question, the last question is, uh, I, I used to reminiscing of the old decadent British Empire. <coughs> I never thought, I never thought I'd be doing this, but I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the last bit. <laughs> How perfectly ghastly. Uh, well, maybe someone can tell me what the British bit was. Am I reminiscent of it? Well, that would be for someone else to say. Um, am I nostalgic for it? I could say. But the, I think, uh, as with the rest of the question, I'm going to make an arrogant assumption. I'm going to say that I don't believe anyone will object if I say I've had enough of it. And uh, I have answered all those questions already. And um, it's time for me uh, to go and sign books. But thank you very much. Can indeed. you take one more? Can you just one more, sir? I came a long way. Mr. Hitchens, can you take one more?